Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last few videos, we looked at how we can determine the probability that a given ensemble of molecules will have a given energy, E. And at the end of the last video, we saw that we can express that probability using this equation. However, we still don't know how that energy manifests itself in those molecules. You might recall from several videos in both this course and the Physical Chemistry 1 course, that the energy of a molecule can exist as rotational, vibrational, electronic, or translational energies. Three of those four forms of energy involve motion, rotational, vibrational, and translational. And it's those that I want to focus on today. If we want to understand how the energy of a system is distributed among these forms of energy, we need to look at the number of degrees of freedom the molecules have. Let's start with the translational energy. Translational energy is simply the motion of a molecule as it moves through space. In other words, it's pure kinetic energy. We can write that using this equation, which you're probably already familiar with. Notice that I'm using the symbol lowercase epsilon for the energy instead of capital E. That's because this energy only represents the translational energy and not the rotational, vibrational, or electronic energies. To get the total energy, E, we'd have to add all those together. Anyway, this equation for the kinetic energy isn't too useful because we'd have to know the velocity of each molecule in order to calculate it. However, we can use some of the information we've talked about in the last few videos to help us out. First, though, let's remember that the velocity is a vector quantity, where the velocity vector is composed of velocities along the x, y, and z axes. That means we can rewrite this by splitting the kinetic energy into three separate terms, one each for the velocity along the x, y, or z axis. Now, we're dealing with a system that's an ensemble of molecules, which means it consists of an extremely large number of molecules on the order of Avogadro's number. That means we should look at the average translational energy and the average velocities in the x, y, and z direction. The first term on the right side is just the average translational energy for motion in the x direction. And from our earlier discussion of the velocity distribution, we know that we can get that by multiplying the kinetic energy for each possible velocity by the probability of having that velocity, and then integrating. Let's simplify this expression a bit by taking the mass and the factor of 1 half out of the integral. But wait. In the last video, we saw that the probability p can be expressed using this equation. So let's plug that into our formula. We can now split this into two integrals, one in the numerator and one in the denominator. Notice that the summation symbol has been dropped out. That's because taking the integral really makes that redundant. Taking the integral over all possible velocities corresponds to taking the sum over all possible translational energy states. Now, let's simplify the two integrals. It turns out that both integrals are symmetric. So, from your calculus course, you know that taking the integral from negative to positive infinity is equivalent to just taking the integral from 0 to infinity and doubling it. That gives us this. Now we can simplify by canceling the two factors of 2 out of the equation. What can we do now? Well, it turns out that both of these definite integrals have known solutions that we can look up in a table of integrals. For example, here's one integral with a known solution. If we compare this to the integral in the numerator of our equation, we can see that the x in the general equation corresponds to vx in our equation. And a in the general equation is m over kb times t in our equation. That means that the numerator can be written like this. 1 fourth times the square root of pi times 8 times kb cubed times t cubed over m cubed. Meanwhile, the integral in the denominator corresponds to this general equation. Once again, a is equivalent to m over kb times t, and x corresponds to r vx. That means the denominator can be written like this, 1 half 
times the square root of pi times 2 times kb times t over m. Now let's simplify the overall equation. The terms outside the square roots can be simplified to m over 4. Inside the square roots, the pi's cancel out, and some of the kb's, t's, and m's cancel out to give us the square root of 4 times kb squared t squared over m squared. We can take the square root of those terms, so we have m over 4 times 2kb t over m. And that simplifies to 1 half kb t. That's a nice simple result. It gives us the translational energy of a particle along the x-axis. We can plug that into our earlier equation for the translational energy. The terms for the y and z directions should give us the same result. After all, the x, y, and z axes are completely arbitrary, so that means the overall translational energy is equal to 3 halves times kb t. Notice that we say that the translational energy has three degrees of freedom, and each of them contribute one half kbt to the overall translational energy. That's all for the translational energy. And it turns out that the rotational energy behaves similarly. Just like the translational energy, each rotational degree of freedom contributes one half kb times t to the overall rotational energy. And how many rotational degrees of freedom are there? We'll talk about that in the next video. There are always three degrees of freedom for translational energy, but the number of rotational degrees of freedom depends on the structure of the molecule. The vibrational energy is similar. Like the rotational energy, the number of vibrational degrees of freedom depends on the structure of the molecule. However, unlike the case for translational and rotational energy, each vibrational degree of freedom contributes kb times t to the overall energy, not one half kb times t. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll finish our discussion of how the energy of a system is distributed between rotations, vibrations, and translations. And we'll combine that with something we discussed in the last video, the partition function. That'll allow us to look more deeply at how different types of energy are distributed in a system. I hope you'll join me for that. But in the meantime, have a good week.